Um, that's the last, uh, last uh, section of the day remaining, um, which is the freshest and the uh, youngest and it points to the future. Um, we would like to announce uh, the first EU Tax Observatory Young Researcher Award. And um, I will explain you very briefly uh, how we decided on the nominations and on the winners. And um, then we will have uh, presentations from the winners, very brief presentations, but uh, with very interesting uh, finding, findings. So um, this year's award, um, the nominations took into account empirical papers uh, with uh, direct implications for uh, EU economic uh, tax policy. We invited submissions uh, of completed master's thesis uh, and research, research papers from uh, uh, PhD dissertations. Um, and in general, uh, we announced that the award encourages um, and recognizes innovative research uh, by graduate students in the field of taxation, tax evasion, uh, tax havens, tax competition, and international tax uh, harmonization. Uh, we believe that this is an important uh, initiative for us. It encourages young researchers to pursue applied policy relevant work in taxation. And uh, I think it is relevant to the EU institutions and to governments in general. Uh, overall, we received uh, 19 nominations for the award. Uh, nominees were um, uh, university professors that nominated students. And uh, the nominations were evaluated by a scientific team uh, set up by the EU Tax Observatory uh, with four specific criteria, one being innovative, secondly, uh, using novel data sets, uh, thirdly, having a sound scientific uh, grounding, and uh, fourthly, producing uh, policy-relevant outcomes. Uh, after much deliberation since uh, April, um, uh, the award for this year goes to two excellent papers uh, in uh, uh, taxation. Firstly, to a co-authored paper by uh, Jean Pomar and Seguin uh, Leguerne for their paper uh, will we ever be able to track offshore wealth evidence from the offshore real estate market in the UK? And secondly, to uh, Baptiste Suya uh, for his paper, Profit Shifting Employee Pay and Inequalities, Evidence from US Listed Companies. So a big uh, round of applause for the winners. Um, Both papers satisfy the criteria of the committee. They make excellent use of novel data sets um, and empirical methods. They are innovative and they produce policy relevant results. Uh, all three winners are PhD students um, in uh, Jean Pomaris, uh, the Pi uh, Paris School of Economics, uh, Sekan Leguerne at the uh, Sciences Po, and Badi Suyard at the ULB here in Brussels. Um, so uh, we have the pleasure to have with us the authors uh, who have been informed and uh, they will present very short uh, presentations uh, of 10 minutes each of uh, the findings and the results. I think it will be interesting for everyone. Uh, but before I would like to ask them to come and collect their awards officially. <laughs> a co-author paper. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Segal uh, um, and uh, Jean. Okay. So, yeah. okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we have slides somewhere. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I'm a PhD student at the Paris School of Economics and Segal here is a PhD student at Sciences Po. Thank you. 
And we're working on a paper which is called Will We Ever Be Able to Track Offshore Wealth? Um, evidence from the offshore real estate market in the UK. So the starting point of our paper is that there is a growing body of evidence on financial offshore wealth. So in particular, we know that there is a large amount of wealth that is held in tax havens. So about the equivalent of 8% of global household financial wealth at least. But we don't have a lot of evidence on non-financial offshore wealth, so artwork or real estate, for example. And this is what our paper focuses on, and specifically we focus on offshore real estate. So how do we do that? We studied the common reporting standard that we talked about uh, for quite a long time. So the CRS was announced by the OECD in 2014, and it is a multilateral agreement of automatic exchange of information. So it encompasses a lot of countries. So today you have more than 100 countries that committed to implement the CRS, so to exchange information within each other. And so this is why it's very often considered as the most comprehensive transparency policy to date. Um, and it's been shown to have reduced cross-border bank deposits uh, that are held in tax havens. So it's hard to pin down the exact uh, decrease in uh, offshore deposit that it uh, caused, but we know that it had a significant effect. Um, and again, it's been said before, one issue with the CRS is that it only covers financial assets. So basically, one way you could avoid the CRS reporting requirements would be to reshuffle your offshore portfolio from financial assets to uh, from financial assets to non-financial assets. So this is the switching uh, reaction that we try to quantify in our paper. And to do that, we focus on the offshore real estate market in the UK. So why the UK first? The UK real estate market, and in particular, the London real estate market, is very globalized. And it is also um, very attractive for people at the top of the income and the wealth distribution globally. So we have data on admin administrative data on real estate purchases that are made by foreign companies in the UK. So for example, we're going to observe uh, a company incorporated in Jersey buying a mansion in the center of London. And in fact, more than 90% of the companies we observe in our data are incorporated in tax havens. So one issue here is to try to quantify the switching effect uh, we want to study. We would need to know the residence of the person actually making the purchase through this company. So who is the beneficial owner of this uh, company in Jersey? And to do that, we exploit another set of data, so the leaks data and the open leaks data. The leaks data, so Panama Papers, Pandora Papers and the other leaks, give information on a lot of shell companies that have been uh, created since 1959, if I remember well. And the open leaks data uh, give information on companies incorporated in Luxembourg. So I'm going to let Segal finish. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So for how to okay. okay for the methodology. So what we do is we exploit uh, two events that were important in the implementation of tax transparency globally. So the first one is in September 2013 when the J20 country endorsed the standard for uh, automatic exchange of information. And the second set of events is in March and May 2014, when 67 countries, including a lot of tax events, uh, announced that it would commit to exchange information under the CRS. So in order to uh, evaluate whether these two events uh, led to higher demand for real estate in the UK, what we do is that we combine uh, property transaction data to our corporate ownership data, so the leaks and open leaks data, data set, and based on the fact that some tax havens were uh, more exposed to the CRS than other. So let me explain a bit. So we, uh, starting from the leaks data and open leaks data, we can observe who incorporates firms in what countries. And for example, we know that a lot of uh, investors from France or for Spain incorporate a lot of firms in Luxembourg, but do not incorporate so many firms in Seychelles or Mauritius. And therefore, using observing who incorporates uh, companies where, we can identify a small sub uh, subset of uh, tax havens that are particularly uh, used by the residents that come from the countries committing to the CRS. So there is a small subset of tax events that are particularly affected by the CRS. 
and we simply and therefore it's an interesting group to study uh, how much they buy in real estate compared to other countries and then one problem is that with our data we observe the companies that buy the properties but we don't observe who are the, the owners of this company and therefore we don't observe the ultimate owners of the property in the UK so in order to uh, circumvent this issue we, uh, as we said, we match our data uh, to our transaction data to the leaks and open leaks in order to have information on who are the individuals who buy UK property through shell companies. Now, uh, let me uh, show you a, a very small uh, result, uh, very, very briefly a result. Here in this graph, we show total uh, amount invested in real estate for firms incorporated in the highly exposed tax havens in red and for firms incorporated in all other havens. And what we see is that before 2030, so before the CRS is announced, there is a similarity both in level and in trends in terms of real estate investment that start to diverge immediately after the CRS is implemented. So this is very suggestive of high response to the CRS. So people affected by the CRS start to invest more in real estate. So to sum up a bit, a bit our result, what we have, so uh, in the UK, we estimate that between 16 and 19 billion of pounds have been invested in real estate due to the CRS. And uh, based on our uh, match with the um, uh, beneficial ownership data, we see that uh, the response is particularly sharp for residents from the G20 countries and even for uh, more so for UK residents. Then globally, we estimate that, so our estimates suggest that at a global scale, this effect would translate into a 19 billion pounds effect, which would suggest that uh, uh, um, if we uh, take all of the financial wealth that fled tax havens as a result of the CRS, 25% of this financial wealth was ultimately shifted into real estate. So now policy implications very briefly we've talked a lot uh, uh, about it before so there is a need to implement broad information uh, um, uh, exchange treaties including of course uh, real estate and the prerequisite for that is a comprehensive, comprehensive real estate asset registers as a national scale so for example we need to know who are the owners of this company acquiring real estate in the uk thanks Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for uh, this amazing conference and uh, also for the award. I'm super honored uh, to receive it. Uh, so to introduce myself very fast, I'm Baptiste Suyam, a PhD student here in Brussels. Uh, so I mainly work on uh, corporate income taxation and tax avoidance, mainly on uh, profit shifting activities of multinational firms. And the paper that I would like to present super fast today is about the effect of these activities on employee pay and income inequalities. Okay, so just to present you super fast uh, what motivated this project, uh, and I think that it's going to be super easy given the topic of this conference, uh, but it's super clear now in 2022 that corporate tax avoidance has become a major policy concern. Okay, uh, so it has been all over the news uh, uh, with the recent tax scandals, the rise uh, uh, of income inequalities, the persistence of budget deficits in Europe, but also in the US. We can also think about the pandemic uh, that has somehow uh, emphasized the importance of public goods. Um, and it's true that when we are thinking about corporate tax avoidance, uh, we have this very particular group of firms in mind, which is a group of multinational companies. Okay, so they're accused of large scale tax avoidance and profit shifting. Okay, and it's true that there is a literature, of course, in profit shifting. Uh, and we know, for example, quite well now how multinational firms avoid uh, uh, taxes and shift their profits to tax havens. They will transfer mispricing, uh, intra firm royalty payments, and all of these things. But we still know very little about the consequences of these activities. Okay, uh, and in particular, we still I mean, we know very little about uh, the effect of these activities on income inequalities. Okay, uh, so you can see me coming. Uh, so basically, what I do in this paper uh, is that I try to uh, to fill this gap in a way. Okay, so but before uh, coming to the core of the paper, and just let me say a few words about the potential mechanism uh, uh, that could uh, uh, occur, okay, on how, in theory, uh, profit shifting could affect income inequalities. 
So um, actually, maybe the effect of profit shifting on wages uh, is maybe best visualized um, through the, uh, uh, the lens of what we call rent sharing models. Okay, so in very simple terms, uh, um, economic activities take place. Okay, profits are made and we can picture profits as a pie. Okay, and then this pie is shared between the firm and the workers. Okay, and in this type of models, uh, profit shifting induces two different type of effects. Okay, opposite effects. So first effect, which is maybe the most uh, intuitive one, is that uh, because profit shifting reduces income taxes, uh, it increases the size of the pie. Okay, so all other things being equal, uh, if workers get the same share of the pie, if the pie is getting larger, wages should go up. Okay, so this is the first effect and the most intuitive one. But then you have also another effect that is clearly less intuitive maybe, is that, uh, uh, I mean, some papers in the literature say that because this profit sh shifted away, uh, shifted offshore, I mean, overseas, uh, workers have an imperfect information about the size of the pie, okay, about the profitability of the firm. And because of that, actually, uh, they lose some sort of bargaining power, okay? So, okay, the size of the pie is getting larger, but they, they attract a lower share of the pie, okay? So you can see that there are two effects, huh? ambiguous at the end of the day, and uh, uh, one paper in the literature predicts that in any case, the effect, uh, the negative effect should dominate uh, and that the effect on wages should be negative, okay? But what I'm, I'm arguing in the paper is that actually, if you allow for different type of workers, that maybe the effect on profit shifting is not the same for all of these workers. In particular, if you make a distinction between the executives, you can think of CEOs and CFOs, and non-executive employees, maybe the effect is not exactly the same for both type of guys, okay? Um, and in particular, in particular, if you uh, look at CEOs and CFOs, huh, the negative effect that I was mentioning, the fact that they shift, the profits are shifted abroad and that they lose bargaining power because they have no precise idea about the size of, uh, uh, of profits, but for this guy, this uh, channel is less likely to, to kick in, okay? Because they oversee business and financial operations. So profit shifting or not, they know, well, they have a very good knowledge about the profitability of the firm. Okay, so actually you, what you can expect is a positive effect huh, for uh, the compensations of CEOs and CFOs and uh, if anything, a negative effect for non-executive employees. Okay, and this is actually the main assumption that I'm testing in this paper. Okay, so uh, um, in this paper, say, it's a mostly empirical paper. Okay, so it's basically uh, divided into two parts. In the first part, I construct a rich database that contains information on the financial statements, the executives, and uh, the foreign subsidiaries of publicly listed firms, okay, uh, in the 90s and 2000s. And then what I do, uh, I'm with the database that I perform an event study. So in other words, what I do is that I scrutinize uh, the evolution of employee pay before and after firm entry into tax events, okay, and I make a distinction between executives and non-executive employees to say something about inequalities, okay. So I will skip uh, the technicality part uh, and I will jump in directly into the results, okay. So the results are, Displayed in this graph, okay, you can see three bars. Uh, the two first bars on the left uh, are for executives, uh, so this is the bars I will focus uh, uh, on first, and then I will say something about the third bar for non-executive employees. Okay, so the data that I have are pretty convenient uh, because actually I am able to identify CEOs and CFOs, and I can also say something about whether they receive after-tax incentives or not. Okay, so. On the graph, what you can see is the evolution of the compensation of this guy. And yeah, uh, well, uh, when I'm talking about compensation, it's a very broad image of compensation. Uh, it's not only in salaries, but it also includes uh, bonuses, stock options, and all these things, okay? Um, so you have the results for CEOs and CFOs, okay? First bar, it's the CEOs and CFOs that do not receive after-tax incentives. And you can see that actually nothing's really going on huh? before and after from entering to tax havens, the compensation doesn't really move, okay? But on the other hand, what you can see, and this is the red bar in the middle of the graph, that for CEOs and CFOs, huh? actually uh, the compensation goes up, okay? Following firm entry into tax havens. And what I show in your paper is that actually uh, uh, this takes the form of non-equity incentive plans, huh, which is actually quite expected because this is the cash that is tied to economic and performance uh, uh, and financial performance, okay? So you can see that, okay, 
If anything, uh, uh, following uh, firm entry into tax havens, the compensations of CEOs and CFOs goes up. Okay, uh, it's uh, uh, um, an increase of around eight percent. Okay, so this is quite significant. First thing for executives, it goes up. Second effect, uh, second uh, group for non-executive employees, and this is the uh, the blue bar. You can see that if anything, uh, total payments to non-executive employees goes down. Okay, and again, it was expected uh, in light of the mechanism that I was uh, mentioning uh, a few minutes ago. Okay, so overall, you have uh, an, inequ uh, an inequality depending effect of uh, from entry into tax havens uh, uh, on employee pay. Then, what I do before concluding is that I uh, investigate whether this inequality depending effect of profit shifting is magnified in firms that are intensive in intangible assets. And why do I make this uh, uh, distinction? Because we know, again, from the literature, that intangible assets are massively used for profit shifting purposes. Okay, uh, so these uh, firms that are intensive and intangible assets, uh, they can use, for example, intra firm royalty payments in order to uh, shift their profits to a low tax jurisdiction, uh, jurisdiction. Okay, and what you can see on the graph is that actually the more intensive the firm in intangible assets, the larger the inequality depending effect of profit shifting on wages, okay? So this is the two main results uh, of the paper. So to conclude very fast, so what I do in this paper is that I, I uh, confirm uh, uh, in line with anecdotal evidence that profit shifting uh, exacerbates within firm pay inequalities. Uh, if anything, the compensation of CEOs and CFOs goes up while uh, the uh, total payments to non-executive employees go down, okay? This effect is magnified in, intensive, uh, in intangible intensive firms and at the end of the day, I think that it has a very important policy implications. Okay, so first of all, it sheds some light on the distribution and impact of profit shifting. And this is something that, as I said, uh, is quite relatively uh, little known in the literature. Second thing, in a way, it helps understand maybe uh, the rise in income inequalities that we have seen in, uh, uh, over the last decades. Okay, and we have seen in parallel a development of profit shifting. Okay, so profit shifting has been one of the mechanisms uh, maybe uh, uh, behind this rise in income inequalities. And finally, uh, uh, last but not least, the further support the implementation of fancy profit shifting measures. Okay, so if anything is that when these uh, reforms are uh, discussed, there is a big focus made on corporate income tax revenues. Okay, but with this paper, basically what I'm uh, showing is that if the objective of public authorities is also to tackle uh, uh, income inequalities, but actually uh, uh, these measures are even uh, uh, very good news uh, in a way. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. And that's it.